Joffrey, the queen. Nick rose with a shock, as if something beyond the realm of what is known as reality pushed him through death's gate and gave his life the fear that would create purpose. The bathtub was littered with larvae, feces, dirt, bits of grass, and all things meant to be washed off a body, he thought to himself. It's a real fucking bummer I don't have a shower. He shambled to the toilet. I will clean this shit later. Nick stated firmly out loud as he pushed his waist into the toilet. He stood up with a flush and made his way naked down the narrow stairwell. Who the fuck designed this duplex? He thought to himself. Got to stay focused and write down this dream. He made his way to his bedroom and pulled out a composite notebook and began to write as follows. I was too damn high, but I wanted to get higher. I needed to burn away the memories with herb and fire and chemicals if need be. I reached into my rucksack, an old weathered pile of leather and regret. It was made of canvas as gray as the hair on my balls. It had pockets on the side and front that were much bigger on the inside. I pulled out my trusty pipe Stevesy, a purple whale with a hole in its head for the herb and a hole in its tail for my cracked whiskery lips. I opened the pouch on the side and looked inside. I saw the outlines of plastic baggies filled with various shadowy shapes. It was too fucking dark out. Too fucking dark to see my herbs. Too fucking dark to see Stevesy. God damn, is it fucking dark? I opened the top of my sack again. I'm always forgetting shit. Always having to go in and out of the damn bag. It's such a fucking pain. I rummaged through the bag. The first thing I felt was a bag full of something squishy, which was probably the salted meat. Then I felt something hard and round and flat. Well, fuck, that was probably a pan. I felt a little bit more past the cup, past the numerous bottles of cough syrup and felt something long and hard in there. Pulled that fucker out, twisted the bottom, and a bright beam of tiny particle waves fired out of it. Bam, that's what I fucking wanted. I held the flashlight up to the side pouch. So what are we going to smoke tonight? Clearly labeled bags lined the pouch salvia, peyote, opium, San Pedro, tobacco, shrooms, a jar of LSD, and that classy gent cannabis. Decisions, decisions. I grabbed opium, salvia, and cannabis. Well, let's start this right. I loaded Stevesy with opium. Pulling out my lighter, it was a bic I stole from a gas station. It had a cactus with a trippy-ass face on it, with the words El Nopal beneath. I sat down on the pile of leaves beneath me in the too fucking dark to see woods. I opened the bag of sweet, sweet weed and loaded a fatty in Stevesy's head. Somebody's got weed on the brain, huh, Stevesy? I chuckled at my pathetic attempt at humor and then smoked that bowl like my life depended on it. By this point, my throat felt like it was filled with gravel. Ah, fuck my throat. I was feeling surprisingly good. It was time to finish what I had started. I grabbed the salvia, loaded a small bowl and smoked it up in like three or four hits. I sat there and stared at the great horned owl sitting in the tree in front of me, and at the seamless canopy above me, and started to think. The hooting of the owl snapped me out of my stroll down memory lane. I packed my shit up, and headed south down a convenient trail in the woods. I walked in a daze for quite some time in the two fucking dark woods. When I saw a faint light, it was a campfire. A campfire means people. Whenever there are people, there's opportunity for drugs, money, and supplies. I headed towards the fire, licking my lips. There was a large bush blocking the view of the light. I could hear a bass riff piercing through the two fucking dark woods. It was smooth and hauntingly funky. I inched towards the bush and peered through. I saw a bald man with bulging muscles. He was wearing a black sleeveless shirt and jeans ripped at the knees. In his hands was a crimson bass guitar with a huge axe blade on the bottom. I looked down at myself to ensure I was presentable and walked out of the bushes. I like the tunes, man, I spouted. The man stopped playing and stood up in an instant. He flipped his axe around, gripping it by the neck. He shouted, Die, you motherfucker, he charged me. I dodged his massive blow. I felt a huge gust of wind blow past my person. Fuck, man, that's no way to say hello. I responded as cool as ever. He swung horizontally at my head while shouting, Why haven't you changed? I ducked beneath it and slid behind him. I don't know what you're talking about. He lowered his axe and in a confused tone said, You're human then? As opposed to what, I said. Those creatures, I've been killing them all night, haven't you seen them? No, why don't you tell me about it over some of that corned beef and hash you've got in that pan over there? I'm Nick, by the way. Yeah, Nick, that sounds nice. I'm Dan. Dan walked over to the pan and sat down. I sat next to him. I reached into my rucksack and pulled out a plate and he slapped some food on it. 
Then he told me all about what he was doing in these fucking woods. He said he was a member of a sacred sect of warrior musicians called the Songbirds, and he was sent here to dispatch an evil entity known as the Elder God, Yub Shibigaroth, and that its minions, a shape-shifting evil known as the Gormath patrol these woods and the abandoned church in which he resides. I told him I was a vagabond traveling the world doing odd jobs to get by. When we had finished, Dan stood up and said, I've got a job for you. Aid me in dispatching this evil and I will pay you the thousand bucks the order gave me for supplies. I agreed and he gave me a machete and we set out leaving the fire burning so we could see a little bit further into the night. He put on a headlight and gave me one. We turned them on and set out to do a job that needed to be done. We walked through the woods with a machete and axe at the ready. When an elderly lady stepped out of the bushes, she had a spotted dress with wrinkly disgusting sacks of old hag flesh hanging out for every onlooker to see. She had a wicker gardening hat on and bifocals that were permanently perched on her crooked vulture nose and a face so wrinkled that it looked more like a scrotum than a face. She opened her hair-lipped mouth to expose a gaggle of disgustingly placed teeth and bright red gums with blood streaming from them into her foul orifice. Have you seen my son? Where is my son? Are you my son? She repeated over and over again like a broken record. Dan raised his axe and charged at her. When he was within a yard of her, she exploded blood and organs fired out in all directions, like fleshy shrapnel. And standing there where she once stood was a shiny black creature with skin like vinyl and coarse ridges and veins all over his body, his ribcage sticking out through his skin like an impoverished baby, and long sharp fingers without any nails, and a spiked arched back. He loomed over Dan by about three or four feet, with bony arms that had a reach of five or six feet. This was the Gormath, the minions of the elder god Yub Shibigaroth. Dan swung at him and I charged with my machete. The creature leaped several feet into the air above Dan's axe and landed in front of me. I didn't hesitate. I jumped on its knee and stabbed it in the ribs as I jumped past it and rolled on the ground. As I looked up, Dan was connecting a blow on the Gormath's back and cleaved it in half. A foul stench filled the air. The creature took a few steps and then fell on its back, its mouth ajar. Dan turned to me and said, This is the tricky part you have to piss in its mouth so it doesn't come back to life. What the fuck are you talking about? Look, I would do it, but I've killed like five of these things and I'm out of fluids. Fuck, man, it looks dead to me. Why don't we move on? We argued for a while, then suddenly the creature coughed. It suddenly stood back up and with its arms pressed itself back together. The seam between the two halves of the creature sealed, and out of the back sprouted a pair of membranous wings. It loomed over us and screeched with a sickening pitch and tone that reverberated throughout the woods like a siren in a storm. Dan slapped me in the back of the head and said, See what you did? Why didn't you just fucking piss in its mouth like I said? I shrugged, and then we lunged at the unearthly foe. It started to take to the air, so we both dug our blades into its legs. The Gormoth laughed a sickening echo bellow, that had a quality of harmonized tones each one deeper than the last. We kept climbing up its body with our weapons as we soared through the woods. Hold on to me, Dan shouted. I grabbed his legs, and he swung his axe far back and let it come down, slicing the Gormath clean in half. He fell to the ground. You better fucking piss this time, Dan shouted before we hit the ground. We landed with a crash. I stood as quickly as possible looking for the top half of the body. I found it in some bushes. I whipped my dick out and started pushing with my abdomen. I pushed and pushed, but I couldn't piss. I tried thrusting out towards the Gormath's head and thought of a running hose and waterfalls that always seems to work. I felt my muscles tighten as I got lightheaded, and then suddenly a surge of positive feelings overwhelmed me, and then it finally came. A hard stream of urine blasted out of me like a rocket and into the Gormath's mouth. It screamed and hissed and then thick black smoke filled the air and when the smoke dissipated the body was gone. Well that was fucking crazy. Where do we go now I exhaled as I zipped up my pants. He was heading for the church. No doubt let's continue in the direction he was going, said Dan as he pointed in the direction the Gormath was heading with his axe. We headed down the forest some more when we saw lights in the distance. That must be the church, I exclaimed. As we darted for the church, seven of the ugliest children stepped in our way. They wore overalls. All of them had disgusting wrinkled faces and gray hair. In unison they said, Give us candy, we want candy, give us your candy. We charged at them and they exploded just like the old woman bits of organs and blood spattered on our persons. We swung at the seven Gormath. One lunged an arm at me and I leaped on it and jumped towards its head decapitating it. 
Dan tossed me a jar. It's full of my piss. I opened it and poured it into the creature's mouth. Why didn't we use that earlier? I exclaimed. Landing on my feet, a cloud of thick black smoke exploded behind me. Dan, ducking beneath two Gormath's arms, swung his axe, cutting both in half. I tossed him the jar and he poured it into their mouths. I need to save it for now, he shouted as two huge explosions of thick black smoke boomed in front of him. A Gormath loomed over him. I ran up its back and stabbed my machete straight through its skull and it fell to the ground. Dan ran towards the three remaining Gormath and tossed me the jar in passing. I poured some into its mouth and turned towards the three remaining Gormath. Thick black smoke exploded behind me. Dan jumped in the air and split one Gormath clean in half. I tossed him the jar and ran towards the other two. Both of them lunged their arms at me. I jumped onto the crossed claws and bounced up to their heads, spun and decapitated both. He walked over to me and poured cool urine into their mouths. How much pee do we have left? I was exhausted from the action. Half a jar, he half laughed and patted me on the shoulder. We headed towards the doors of the church. Dan grabbed my shoulder before I pushed open the doors. I turned to him and he looked me in the eye and said, You're really good at this, where'd you learn to fight? I don't remember, it's just like instinct. Is that why you're traveling, Nick, to learn who you are? Yeah. Are you ready for this? Yeah. All right, let's fucking do this. We turned and pushed open the doors and ran inside. The room was filled with hanging chandeliers with burning candles. It was a big fucking place. It looked like it had been gutted for vile deeds. And there floating in the big open room was the elder god Yub Shibigoroth, a massive vile creature. It was like a giant set of pursed lips and a hand with long bony fingers and a longer middle finger that looked shriveled and veiny. It had vinyl-like skin similar to the Gormath, with thousands of tiny eyes on stalks. The lips moved and the beast spoke. Behold his dismemberment. It slowly floated towards us. Dan lunged at it and launched his axe straight into the beast's head. The axe shattered into billions of tiny glossy shrapnel. The creature emitted from its eyes a thousand tiny beams that covered Dan with its eye beams. He began to glow his skin slowly dripping from his body, a pool of iridescent luminous slime pooling around the sickening monstrous sight of what was Dan. His pack full of supplies and money dropped. I took it and ran leaving him to die because, fuck man, I don't want to fucking die, not like that. Not by that scary fucking thing I headed out past the church and looked for a spot to make camp. Damn, I'm a pretty good writer, thought Nick. He closed the composite notebook and wrote messages from beyond on the cover. What time is it? Thought Nick. He shot a glance at the clock on the floor next to the uncovered mattress he slept on. It was a rotary clock made to look like one from the 50s, but had been manufactured sometime in the mid-2000s during the mid-century modern revival of the time. It read, 5.32 a.m., 32. Fuck, it's early. Okay, good. That gives me time to fix what the critters chewed up and take them to the wooden nickel when it opens. See if I made any money last night. Nick said to himself. He began to get dressed. He threw on some blue boxers, then some mustard corduroy pants, a turquoise-encrusted belt with steer-head buckle, a coral button-up shirt. He left the top three buttons open. He put some decorative socks with each foot, adorning a separate pattern, and some olive monk-strap Oxford shoes. He felt exceptionally well today and decided to dress accordingly. As he made his way out of his bedroom, he saw the aftermath from the night before in the kitchen. He began to feel less exceptional at the chaos of food splattered from ceiling to floor, but was pleased to see that the infestation had retired for the evening. He walked to the sink and opened the cabinet underneath. He pulled out a bottle of bleach, some highly illegal insect spray, killing the only other inhabitants of the only home we've ever known, a dubious undertaking. Nick, however, being a collector of antiques, was accustomed to the oddities of days past. He began to wad in his clutched fist an overzealous amount of trash bags and paper towels. Surprised I haven't gotten around to this sooner. Nick thought quietly to himself. He began to dispose of the rotten food in the fridge and pantry, including the milk cartons and oatmeal bowl that had set him off. After filling four trash bags, he walked them out to his trash can in the front of the duplex. He would always see the mob of flies in the afternoon when he normally left for work on his landlord Doug's side. Tonight, the miasma of Musidae was greatly diminished. He saw the masses of food waste on the porches of the neighborhood and wondered. What the fuck happened on whiskey, guns, and politics last night? He placed the bags in the trash can 
and saw the opening blast of color from the dawning of day in the eastern sky and felt a glimmer of hope once again. Today will be a good day, Nick whispered. He walked back inside and began to clean the stains with bleach and elbow grease, pouring the remaining bleach down the drain in the hopes of killing anything that may be gestating in the disposal. He sprayed insecticide with wildish abandon throughout the house. However, he completely forgot about the bathroom considering the deed done. He made his way down to the laundry room to rectify his investments. Homie had made his way deep down into the mines past invading worms. He had consorted with cicada nymph sages. He had slain grubs and devoured termite villains until nearly collapsing at the place of his birth, the labor room. Ant has nutrient, gasped Homie. The big ant crawled down to Homie. Ant has processed scent trail. The big ant grabbed Spoonie, the last of the monster nug cut out for Homie by Jerome packed within it. Homie gave the ant he thought of as Queen his lit mining candle nearly extinguished from the epic quest he had partaken to offer this gift. The big ant took a mad snapper rip and exhaled a fog into the labor room. How do you feel, my queen? Gasped Homie his final words before he collapsed and died. I feel incredible. Queen bellowed. At that moment, ant was no more. Constable, rally the troops. We must find the source. Thought Queen. <sighs> Pipsqueak, do not inform the Chancellor of our new state. Continue to investigate pest minority leader Lucas. We must find source. And to Texum. Find Jerome and lay down a scent trail leading back to the hill. We will come for him. Ant too responded. Why should I? For the greater good of our people. The one called Homie has died, and our kind are born again. You are the Interceptor. Interceptor thought back. I obey no one, but I will agree so that all will have names and all will be free. I am Interceptor. Pipsqueak here. I have rallied troops around the perimeter of the nest. They hide in the trees. I have made my way inside and will monitor Lucas. Constable here, fuck this, I'm drunk. But I'll call some more ants in to drink, I might as well. I mean, fuck it, I have a queen now. Queen responded. Constable, flood the bottoms. Tell them drinks are free for ant. The fear of what we were will ensure the obedience of the bottoms. Constable looked around as he was in the vomit fields and thought, Hella queen. Although to the average ant and to the neighbors of the neighborhood the big ant was no different, they had all discovered through Homie's quest that they were mistaken. 